Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at The Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. The Naked Reflections podcast team had a massive row this week. You see, conflict resolution is our subject, and we couldn't agree on who to invite, how to tackle it. Okay, okay, I jest. But trying to resolve conflict is a very tricky matter and can lead to disputes even among the peacemakers themselves. The historian Margaret Macmillan considered these matters in a recent edition of Naked Reflections, The Changing Face of Human Conflict. Making peace is very difficult indeed because it leaves such great passions behind and a desire for revenge. But I think what was the case in 1919, and certainly in 1945 at the end of the Second World War, was that the people who met to make peace had been given a real scare. I mean, they had seen the possibility of their civilization collapsing. And they were afraid, in fact, if they didn't move quickly to establish peace, there would be even more anarchy as they looked towards what was happening in Russia and in the center of Europe and even closer to home. What does it take to make an effective peacemaker? Empathy, perhaps? Attention to detail? Foresight? Knowledge? being hard-nosed with some brutal negotiating skills. I have two guests who fit the bill. Dr. Gershom Bascom is a leading figure in conflict resolution in the Middle East and founder of the Israel-Palestine Center for Research and Information. He joins us from Jerusalem. And Dr. Carlo Aldravandi from the Irish School of Ecumenics at Trinity College Dublin, who studies faith-related peacemaking and religiously motivated violence. Welcome to you both. Now, Margaret Macmillan was talking about peacemaking after the world wars of the last century. But let's focus on the Middle East and in particular, the Middle East today. I think it begins from the basic problem of the non-recognition of identities and national, religious, ethnic desires, aspirations. At least in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that's what it's been about for a long time, the inability of these two people, the Israeli Jewish people, the Palestinian Arab people, to look at each other in the eye and recognize the legitimacy of their existence, their self-determination, their ability to define for themselves that they are a people and that they are connected to a specific piece of territory that we all claim as our own. And as in many conflicts, we have a, a kind of a history of making first claims. Who was here first? Who was here the longest? Whose connection is deeper? Whose is more meaningful? Who is more inspired by divinity? Gershom, you've spoken of actors in the Middle East being stuck in the present, obsessed with the past and unable to see a different future. Well, how do we get out of that trap? Oh, this is the billion dollar question, so to speak. It begins with a problem of leadership. Uh, we have leaders on the Israeli and the Palestinian side and the American side now, maybe that's changing, who are uh, incapable of talking to each other. And, and uh, the inability of the leaders to engage uh, reflects down to the society. So there's a, been a delegitimation in Israel and in Palestine of any engagement, of any contact. Uh, on the Palestinian side, it's formalized into a movement, which they call anti-normalization, of not normalizing relations with, with the other side, with the enemy, while the occupation continues. And on the Israeli side, uh, because of the success of Trump slash Netanyahu in engaging with Arab countries in the region, detached from the Palestinian issue, uh, there is a delegitimation in Israel of the need to talk to the Palestinians because we can make peace with our neighbors and much better neighbors, the Emirates, uh, the Bahrainis, now even Sudan, without having to give up any land or any part of our identity or control. So it's very difficult to break out of, of the reality that we live in. I, I think that there will be a catalyst for change when there is a leadership change. Carlo, if you could sort of offer a comparison perhaps um, with the Northern Ireland situation. So there is a comparison to be made, but uh, two different contexts, and uh, it's, it's important to, to specify this. So Northern Ireland is, uh, is similar, but at the same time there are differences, glaring differences between that context and Israel and Palestine. So my institution, the Irish School, uh, recommends as a long-standing tradition of advocacy, trying to foster a dialogue uh, across boundaries, 
especially with the radical fringes in uh, Northern Ireland. And they did so with a strong emphasis on uh, interreligious dialogue, ecumenics, a kind of discussion within Christianity, the Protestant and Catholics, and uh, also with a strong emphasis on things that have been neglected, community-based grassroots engagement uh, towards uh, reconciliation, and uh, they were at the forefront also with dealing with the past. There was a, a research project that they pioneered, uh, healing through remembrance, and uh, it was very important to understand the past as a, as a huge impact on the definition of the, the present and the future. So dealing with post-traumas was key, and they did so from an from a interreligious uh, standpoint. So Gershon, Carlo touched on the importance of grassroots there in terms of the troubles in, in Northern Ireland and so on. What role does the grassroots play in the Israel-Palestine conflict? You've told us about leadership issues, but what about on the ground? I think in our current reality, the grassroots have the, the task of keeping a, a, a candle burning and not more than that. It's very, very difficult for grassroots who are involved in Israeli-Palestinian cross-boundary activities to even function. The financial resources that were available during the peace process are no longer available. I think when there is an actual peace process going on, there are negotiations, there's hope for resolution, then the grassroots have a much greater role to play because we need to engage in peace at the level of people and not the level of regimes. And all too often, the the peace that exists between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Jordan are pieces between the regimes and not between the people. Um, We've never had a really grassroots people-to-people peace process go on between Israel and its immediate neighbors. So we've touched on the leadership and and we've just heard a bit about the grassroots, but the third sort of similarity, it seems to me, between, and I I take Carlo's point that you can't make too many comparisons, but is, of course, the role of religion, both positive and negative. So, Carlo, you've studied the millenarian drives at the basis of the settlement project, for example, in the occupied territories. Tell us a little bit about your research and how important is the link with uh, American evangelicals, for example? Yes, I, I wrote my PhD on Christian Zionism, and I was very interested in the uh, theological underpinning of this uh, evangelical movement. And it's a very convoluted and complex eschatology that, however, has political implications. And uh, it was very prominent during the Bush administration. It went uh, dormant during the Obama era and came back very strongly with the Trump administration. Uh, largely because Trump received an outstanding uh, support from an evangelical constituency. It was 81% of uh, the evangelical voting bloc that exceeded the support given to Bush in the two mandates. So for me, it was very interesting to see how eschatology, which is a belief that the, you know, advocating the end of the world, impacts on world politics uh, with a strong support given to the state of Israel, but to the most uh, right-wing elements within the state of Israel. So it's the settlement process in the occupied territories and also uh, is very relevant for the advocacy for the Third Temple. So there are two very, you know, as Gershon knows better than I do, two very thorny issues within the peace process. So I would say that it was very strange to see an evangelical constituency in a Bible Belt having influence in the Middle East. So it's a kind of transnational power of religion based on premillennial thoughts on strong eschatological theology that impacts on politics in a nutshell. Well, just unpack the eschaton for some of our listeners, Carlo, before we look at the sort of messianic movements within Israel, if you like. Tell us a little bit about that. How would you explain it in for someone who's not familiar with the, the technical language? It's based on a strong apocalyptic belief that a world transfiguration is supposed to take place basically in the Middle East, the center in Jerusalem. And uh, this uh, uh, Armageddon, this eschatological transfiguration, is supposed to usher into the millennium, which is a kind of utopian reign uh, at the end of time in in which uh, the true Christians will be saved. Christian Zionism is very important because everything hinges on the faith of the Jewish people. So there is a kind of eschatological chain uh, through which uh, Christian salvation would be obtained. And in order to be saved uh, from the Christian evangelical standpoint, the Jewish people must be restored to the land of inheritance, to Earth Israel. Uh, they must fully control Earth Israel. It's a very extensive territorial understanding. And then the Third Temple must be rebuilt. Uh, and so we have uh, Armageddon, uh, Rapture, so on and so forth, and the Christians will be saved. Gershon, 
there is a kind of Jewish equivalent to this, isn't there? There you are in the heart of Jerusalem. Carlo was talking about Christian eschatology and millenarianism. Is there a Jewish version? There, there is a Jewish version. I think it's a lot less bloody. But the, the, the Jewish version is that uh, the settling of the land of Israel is fulfilling the commandments of God. We have 613 commandments in Judaism, and about one-third of them are directly connected with the land of Israel and fulfilling the commandments of God in the land of Israel. The Six Days War in 1967 was it believed to be uh, uh, the beginning of the Messianic era, this miracle um, when many people in Israel in, in the month of May in 1967 thought we were going to see another Holocaust, that Israel was going to be wiped off the face of the planet. And within six short days, it conquered all the territory around us, including all of the land of Israel, or, or at least the part of the land of Israel between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. And this was seen by people who, who were religious or who were becoming religious as a direct message from God and a, and, a, and a call to fulfill the commandments. And that was the beginning of the Israeli settlement movement. And a good part of the ideological settlement in, movement in Israel is messianic. There isn't this sense of an apocalypse, I think, within their theology. It's much more that when we are all fulfilling God's commandments, when we're observing the Sabbath, when we're is settling the land of Israel, when we're being good people, then the Messiah will come. This is Naked Reflections with me, Ed Kessler. My guests this week are Gershon Baskin and Carlo Adravandi. We're discussing conflict resolution. The big picture of Middle Eastern politics is rather daunting, but I guess in the end, it all comes down to what's happening in people's heads. This is where neuroscience can throw some light on the matter, literally so, in the case of Helen Keyes, a perception psychologist who conducted some fascinating brain scan research on the effect of mediation counselling after a row, or the lack of it. She spoke about this on the Naked Neuroscience podcast, larking about play science. It's showing that conflict with your partner is likely to be damaging to your representation of your partner or how you view them. But conflict isn't obviously always avoidable. And this is showing that mediation does seem to have a genuinely beneficial effect. And um, that's not just an effect that we observe in terms of couple satisfaction, but we can also see on a neural level that people are still maintain that reward response when they see their partner following mediated discussions, but not unmediated discussions. Which bit of the brain was it that was particularly distinctive in this? It was the nucleus accumbens, and that's part of the basal ganglia near your hypothalamus. And it's largely associated with reward circuitry in your brain. Carlo, you've looked into the contesting Islamic and Jewish narratives concerning the ownership of the Temple Mount and Haram al-Sharif. And there is Gershon uh, in Jerusalem, probably uh, less than a mile away from the Kotel, the Western Wall. Tell us a little bit about that and the sorts of negotiations that are going on about such a tiny piece of land, you know, a few bricks, a little bit of mortar. Why is it causing so much trouble? It's the most contested uh, piece of real estate in, in the world most, and uh, encapsulates its linchpin to the entire conflict in terms of symbolic assets, I, was, I would say. I think Gershon uh, might speak more authoritatively about this because I know that he wrote a book uh, which analyzes Camp David II and Camp David II failed basically or one of the key reasons at the end they couldn't find an agreement, a final status agreement on the Temple Mount Aram al-Sharif. And today is still very controversial. There is a kind of mirror syndrome between two national religious aspirations, the Jewish one and the Islamic one. And I would say the Temple Mount Aram al-Sharif is a symbol of national belonging, even for people who are not particularly religious. So it's very important on both sides. There is a kind of a twin interpretation of the issue. Some argue that the Temple Mount Aram al-Sharif should be solved at the end of the negotiation. Some argue that it should be dealt with at the very beginning as a kind of, you know, gateway for, for a resolution. Gershon. I agree that this is the most contested piece of real estate in the world, and I don't know that there are there are real solutions for dealing with it. I, I think we need an evolution of solutions to, to deal with it, moving from uh, a recognition of a kind of status quo uh, where uh, what has been proposed in the negotiations until now basically is that the Muslims uh, have control or guardianship or sovereignty or whatever we want to call it, on the surface of the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif, 
and the Jews uh, have it at the Western Wall, which is below the Haram al-Sharif. Um, the Americans really got this confused at Camp David too, when they started proposing uh, what they called horizontal and vertical sovereignty. And, and the Palestinians didn't have the foggiest idea what they were talking about because there was always a suspicion and by the Muslims that Israel is tunneling underneath the Haram al-Sharif to discover the remnants of the first and second temples. And uh, they thought that the Americans were telling the Israelis that they should continue doing that, which would bring about the collapse of the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. It was very complex. I had a conversation with the president of the Sharia, the Islamic High Court in, in Palestine, about the whole issue of Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount. And I asked him, and my understanding is that according to Muslim law, according to Sharia, there's no prohibition from Jews praying on the Temple Mount and the Haram al-Sharif. And he said, no, it's, it's not a religious issue. It's one of control, which led me to believe that if we could resolve this issue, the political side of it, perhaps we could even open up a door in the future where Jews would be welcome to pray there, Muslims be, would be welcome to pray at the Western Wall, which for them is also a holy site called the Burak. But, but I think we need to deal with it first at the political level, and that's the question of control. Israel's control of the Haram al-Sharif for the Muslim world is not acceptable. We'll see what happens when there are more Muslims coming from the parts of the Arab world that Israel is now making peace with, the Emirates in Bahrain and eventually Saudi Arabia. There were some problems last week when some Emiratis were here and prayed in Al-Aqsa, and they were treated very badly by Palestinians who were on in, in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and, and that was quite interesting because they're Muslims who are essentially fulfilling part of the pilgrimage, part of the obligation to come to Jerusalem. But I think it, it's basically, it begins with a political a level and then moves into the religious. For me, uh, the dispute of the Temple Mount uh, and Al-Aqsa, Aram al-Sharif, a whole Esplanade in neutral terms, uh, for me also uh, represents a kind of clash in worldviews. It's a kind of confrontation between the understanding of international law and secular peacemaking and the religious understanding of that symbolic asset. And uh, it boils down to the issue of sovereignty, which according to the approach of conflict resolution, you know, can be dealt with in some, it's a territorial asset that can be divided, like in the Clinton parameters of 2000. And according to a national religious perspective, both within Israel and the Muslim world cannot be divided because uh, it has a, the utmost level of sanctity. So it's an asset, sanctity cannot be divided. And uh, it's a kind of sacred value that uh, is protected against the territorial bargain. And for me, a political solution should engage with this religious dimension, you know, to First of all, to understand it and then try to devise a diplomatic approach that can deal with that in a more effective way. I agree. It's a great challenge. I, I would think that from what I've heard and seen that we should try to avoid the discussion of sovereignty mm. and talk more about control. Um, there's a story of, of um, a discussion that took place between Yasser Arafat and Bill Clinton at Camp David when Clinton had suggested to Arafat that they agree to place the Haram al-Sharif uh, under the sovereignty of God. And Arafat's response to that was, when you agree to put the White House under the sovereignty of God, we'll agree to put Haram al-Sharif. I asked uh, one of the ideologues from Hamas once if their problem of recognizing Israel was because their view that Palestine is a waqf, a Muslim trust. He said to me, I'm surprised at you. You know, for us, the entire world is a Muslim trust not just Palestine. So I, I think that we need to find solutions that avoid using some of these words that have different, uh, very problematic meanings. So if we can talk about control, about management, and not necessarily about sovereignty over holy places, we might be able to move forward. In my own work, looking at Jerusalem and the holy spaces, it's so interesting uh, that sometimes the third party can be quite a useful, if not mediator, than somebody listening in. And what's so interesting, of course, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, for example, which was a, a place of, of massive Christian conflict between Christian denominations, has worked out some kind of way of living together. So is there something there that Jews in Israel and Muslims in Palestine and, and, and in Israel and, and other parts can actually learn from their Christian brothers and sisters? Or am I just being far too idealistic? Carlo? I think that uh, as far as the Temple Mount al Sharif issue is concerned, uh, there are studies. They try to use the, the good example of the management of the sacred space in the Holy Sepulchre you know, to, 
and uh, they can give some indications. But for me, the major issue is that the Temple Mount Aram al-Sharif issue is connected to the, strongly to the conflict, and uh, is also connected to what is happening in occupied territories. Because Holy Land is a kind of organic whole, and everything is connected. So if something happens, uh, I don't know, in the occupied territories, there will be a repercussion on Temple Mount Aram al-Sharif and vice versa. I'm an advocate of the parties dealing directly with each other without third parties, actually. I think the third parties have really screwed it up here. Um, there's been an over-reliance on the Americans. The Americans have never been impartial mediators. They've never served good offices here. They've always advocated on behalf of Israel and tried to put pressure on the Palestinians. The Europeans, while they have good intentions, have never been able to agree on a position and impose any kind of power on the parties here. The Russians have their own intrigues here. The Chinese are not really interested. Um, the best negotiations that have ever taken place have been between the Israelis and the Palestinians when they were alone together in the room, whether that be in the first set of Oslo talks, where the Norwegians were facilitators and not mediators, or the talks that took place in Taba in 2001, or the Olmert Abbas talks that took place, 42 meetings between them without any third party mediators. And those were the situations where they've reached agreements. Martin Indyk, who headed the talks for John Kerry, told me that once he left the room, presumably to go to the toilet, to enable the Israelis and the Palestinians to talk to each other, and he stayed out of the room for 40 minutes. And he came back into the room, and the two sides were staring at each other and had waited 40 minutes for him to come back. Um, this is the dynamic. When the Americans are in the room, the Israelis talk to the Americans, the Palestinians talk to the Americans, and they don't talk to each other. Gershon, you've done some practical work when it comes to building up trust, if you like, between people on the ground, whether it's about renewable energy or whether it's about um, military matters. Tell us a little bit about that and whether there's anything we can learn from those sorts of discussions. Well, it goes back in, in to this general view that Israelis and Palestinians need to do it directly. The 24 years that I co-directed this joint Israeli-Palestinian think tank that I founded in 1988, I had facilitated, co-facilitated, organized, uh, mediated, uh, together with Palestinian colleagues, more than 2,000 working groups of Israeli and Palestinian professionals dealing with every subject in the conflict, from security to Jerusalem to economics, water, environment, you name it, we, we did it over 24 years. Also, some of the negative experiences that we all lived through in this conflict of September of 2005, uh, my wife's first cousin, one of them was kidnapped and murdered by Hamas. And uh, when he was kidnapped, uh, the family had asked me to get involved to try and help find him, and I didn't succeed, and his body was found, murdered, uh, thrown on the side of a road in the West Bank. When a year later, um, an Israeli soldier was kidnapped and taken off to Gaza, I was approached by someone in Gaza who was living through Israeli bombings and incursions in the immediate aftermath of the attack on the Israeli military base. From that time, that was July 1st, 2006, until five years and four months later, I was making continual efforts to mediate between the government of Israel and Hamas on a prisoner exchange that would bring the Israeli soldier home. Eventually, that happened, and, and I was able to bring about a breakthrough that eventually led to the release of the soldier, and 1,027 Palestinian prisoners were released in the deal. And it was very complex and very difficult. By the way, four people who were responsible for killing my wife's first cousin were released in the prisoner's deal. And his wife, his widow, was one of the people who appealed to the high court in Israel against the deal and, and doesn't speak to me until this day for my involvement in releasing the people who killed her husband. These are very difficult situations, but I think that the element of trust is crucial here, that a trust developed between the liaison on the Hamas side that I've been dealing with, and quite frankly, we've been in touch now for 15 years, and we've spoken to each other thousands of times. We A week doesn't go by, even today, all these years later, that we don't talk with each other, because I think it's important to keep these doors open and to keep these trusting relationships ongoing, even when the parties still refuse to talk to each other. I'm very aware that I'm sitting in Cambridge, 3,000 miles away from you, Gershon, and Carlo, of course, is just a few further miles away. Can we just end by discussing what people outside the conflict, who may have an interest, whether it's personal or professional, or simply humanitarian, in, in terms of facilitating conflict resolution, 
what can we actually do? I'll start with you, Carlo, because I'm sure you've given this some thought uh, yourself, having travelled to the Middle East on numerous occasions. It's a very good question. I First of all, I, I want to say that Gashin's work is, was quite inspirational uh, for me, and I agree with him that uh, I think the mediation should be, take place and led by local stakeholders. And uh, I didn't mediate anything. I was uh, lucky enough to, to, to be present to watch, to observe, and try to understand. I think that uh, uh, international third parties should should try to understand first and uh, foremost before intervening, and uh, it's a very humble exercise. I learned so much by staying silent and uh, watching what was happening on the ground, and I think understanding is far more important than intervening from a third party perspective. A lot of what happens in our conflict here is also based on support that people receive from their diaspora communities. I often ask students from abroad that I lecture to, um, if, if you support Israel or you support Palestine, how are you serving the cause of helping the party that you want to help by engaging in the conflict on your campus, for example? Wouldn't it be much more constructive if you could play a role in getting one Israeli and one Palestinian to talk to each other? And we can do that today with Facebook and with Twitter and with Instagram and all these different media platforms, knock on someone's door and say, talk to me, tell me your story, and then bring people together in that way. And I, I, in my life experience, I, I've never heard no when I've said to someone, tell me your story. I want to understand who you are, what you have to say, not to argue. You can argue down the road. First, listen, first open up your ears and then open up your arms and embrace and see what kind of constructive role you can play. I think that there's also, if you're pro-Palestinian, for example, it would be so much better to find a Palestinian organization or a Palestinian charity or a group of Palestinians and help them uh, to build an economy, to get the skills that they need to build a society and a state, rather than engaging in, in warfare with, with supporters of Israel. Um, this whole notion of boycotts, I'm, I'm not sure, is very effective. If you're pro-Israel, then I think it'd be very helpful to talk to, to Israelis about how it would be possible to engage people that they don't agree with on the other side. And I think that people outside can do it a lot more easily than we can do it inside, where the conflict is so emotional and so uh, acute all the time. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict really mobilizes uh, arts and minds uh, outside Israel and Palestine. And sometimes uh, you develop an opinion without having been there. And uh, sometimes you fall into very manichaean, dualistic approach to that reality. That if you go there, you understand how complex, and, you know, sophisticated and how difficult it is. And uh, it's not black and white. So, yes, the boycott and uh, the anti normalization movements, I think, that uh, should engage with this kind of reality that uh, yeah, is less manichaean, less dualistic uh, and absolute than, than this portrayed. I agree with both of you, and I'm happy to say that we've reached the end of this podcast without falling out. Thanks to my guests, Gershon Baskin and Carlo Aldrovandi. We'd love to hear from you at nakedreflections at wolf.cam.ac.uk. Let us know where we're going wrong, and more importantly, what we're getting right. If you'd like to catch up with our back catalogue, you can find more episodes of Naked Reflections and subscribe to the Naked Reflections podcast wherever you access your podcasts or at nakedscientists.com reflections. I'll be back with more guests next week. <laughs>